Do the trashy pulp novels of the world have anything to offer? Our bestseller is all they're cracked up to be. Here at Terrible Book Club, we explore whether you really can judge a book by its cover or its ridiculous synopsis. You ever passed a book and thought, ugh, who's reading this? We probably are. Welcome to episode 153 of the Terrible Book Club. I'm Paris, and this is Chris. Hello. This time, we read The Labyrinth of Dreaming Books by Walter Moores, translated by John Brownjohn, who has really shitty parents, evidently. <laughs> um, this was recommended to us by our patron, Martin. Martin lent, lent us a... Uh, lent us... Martin sent us... <laughs> A pretty uh, in-depth recommendation, so I'm going to go ahead and read that to you. Uh, on January 2nd of this year, <laughs> uh, Martin suggested that we read The Labyrinth of Dreaming Books, uh, and he said, While not a terrible book per se, here's some backstory. Moores wrote The Thirteen and a Half Lives of Captain Blue Bear and Rumo, two of my favorite fantasy novels, especially Rumo, holy fuck. He also wrote the magnificent The City of Dreaming Books. Ever since then, he's been in a writing slump, pushing out mediocre at best books every few years. It's gotten so far that he had to deny his death. There are no official pictures of him, and he's living reclusive and anonymous somewhere in Germany. He claims Hamburg, which, with the deteriorating level of his work, sparked rumors that he's not a real person, but rather a collective of authors whose best member must have died or quit. (laughs) the thing is that his earlier work is brutally inventive and imaginative and in this book for example as the ultimate lazy page filler he spends several dozen pages summarizing the events of the city of dreaming books in a play that the protagonist has to sit through i think we forgot this part of the recommendation (laughs) (laughs) we got the recommendation a year ago we put it on the schedule and we got to it like at the end of the year and we were like what the why is there just a play talking about the the other book Uh, uh, Martin closes with again in the grand scheme of things not a horrible book it's just the mind boggling discrepancy in craft compared to his earlier work which makes it so hard to read what are your thoughts so Martin uh, today uh, nearly a full year since your recommendation we have our thoughts for you Uh, oh, oh we do uh, thank you, Martin, for being a long-term patient of the Terrible Book Club, and we really appreciate uh, your interaction and you know hanging out with us on the internet and uh, recommending some some interesting ones because I do think this was a this was worth us reading for a few reasons. For sure. So thank you for the recommendation, and we hope you enjoy the uh, discussion today. If this is your first time listening to the Terrible Book Club, what we do here on the show is we read books that we assume will be bad based on their cover, title, summary, or some combination of the three. Sometimes, like today, we read books that our patrons, listeners, or friends recommend. So, we typically do the opposite of what most people do in a bookstore or while they're browsing the internet, and usually this experiment results in a disappointing and hilarious read, although once in a while, we do actually end up liking the book. Uh, Content warnings today. Uh, We got nothing today. I mean, there is a death, uh, and there is something called blood theater, but I, I don't think... This is this is going to be a pretty clean one, folks, except for our usual yeah. barnyard language. So, yeah, it's just book down. jokes. Book jokes. It's Let's just look. a lot of book jokes. Yeah. So really. if you're if you're like allergic to nerds, I mean, what are you doing listening to this show? If that's the <laughs> yeah, <case>. you've <laughs> stumbled into a fatal area of podcasts. <laughs> yeah, you better have your like I don't know your nerd inhaler handy or something. It's an inhaler to protect against nerds, not an inhaler. Oh, for so nerds. it's like oh, a water bottle that you <laughs> spritz them with, like a cat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ah, ah, damn it. Um. Anyway, uh, Chris, why don't you go ahead and read the printed back of the book summary and the characters and setting, and then I will read the wonderful summary uh, that you wrote uh, just this morning 
Uh, we actually we are spending today. This is a work day. Uh, I we are off of work today, <laughs> and we got up at eight a.m. to record a couple of episodes so we could then go on vacation. So it's uh yeah. This is the final push here, guys. Yeah, so that's that's the TBC mood that we're in right now. <laughs> All right. Anyway, here's the back of the book summary. There's a little uh, footnote here we're going to have to address from this back of the <laughs> yeah. book summary. Hilda Gunst von Mythenmetz, hailed as Zemonia's greatest writer, is on vacation in Lindworm Castle when a disturbing message reaches him and he must return to Bookholm to investigate a mystery. The magnificently rebuilt city has once again become a metropolis of storytelling in the book trade. Mythenmetz encounters old friends and new denizens of the city and the shadowy, invisible theater. Astonishingly inventive, amusing, and engrossing, this is a captivating story from the wild imagination of Walter Moores. Okay, so for setting, we are in the world of Zamonia, uh, more specifically in Bookholm, generally. Land of books, city of books, it's made out of books. There's book stuff everywhere. Book stuff happening left and right. The whole economy, the whole society, at least in this city, is based on books. And uh, Zamonia seems to be a broader world that has other city states kind of in it somewhere that we get some allusions to. But this this area is the book place. With you, listen, you're gonna hear me. I'll say the word book a lot here, <laughs> so it's gonna start turning into one of those non-word sounds very quickly. Yeah, it kind of did. It was like when you just you know when you're like a little kid and you're like, what if I just repeat this word over and over again? And then you're like, oh shit, <laughs> I don't. What does that even mean? It's not a, uh, that still happens to be Paris, <laughs> like regardless of age. I mean, I will. I will. Uh, sorry to jump in, but yeah, the world. This world also seems like uh very interested in the arts and supportive of artistic endeavors even if you're not in book home per se so very literary artsy fartsy poems puppets etc okay our protagonist is named optimus yarn spinner not hilda gunst von mythenmetz apparently this was a <laughs> translation thing that happens somewhere where the translator changed the character's name into Optimus Yarn Spinner to reflect, um, I'm guessing, some kind of word joke from German mm -hmm. that occurs, yep. because this was originally written in German, but they didn't catch it on the back of the book. So that's why that was there. I, I mean, who knows? Anyway, Optimus Yarn Spinner is our protagonist. He's a lizard person of some kind. Yes. a scale He's like, yeah, like a... We don't, I mean, there's illustrations also by uh, Morse, but uh, yeah, it's it, dragon-y, kind of a dragon man, kind of. Yeah, long-lived, scaly, he's a renowned author, or at least formerly renowned, it's kind of in question there. Mm -hmm. um, we have various book home inhabitants of all kinds of species, which kind of get blurred together because there's list after list after list of the types of people in an area without too much expansion on many of them except maybe a handful here and there. So it's kind of hard for me to list out exactly all the different types of beings we encounter here. But, you know, you've got book people doing book jobs. There's little gnomes and dwarves doing, like, binding of books and depressing of books and, like, in book cafes or building buildings out of books and all, all that sort of nonsense and whatnot. The only other two characters you should really know are Inazia Ugly, book antiquarian and friend of Optimus. She is some sort of uh, E.T.-like creature based on an illustration that I saw. Uh, like, so real... here's the funny thing is she just looks like a different kind of lizard person to me. Uh, so not sure. Sure. Yeah. And then we also had Ahmed Kibetz, pretty much the same as above. He works with Inazia. They are former friends or current friends even of Optimus, but he just kind of fucked off for 200 years. Listen, I also have a quibble about how in the back of a book summary, it said a vacation to Lindworm Castle. He's been there for 200 years. At a certain point, it's not a vacation anymore, right? <laughs> like, yeah, you're just living there. Even if you're long lived, I mean, he also doesn't describe it as a vacation. He basically just retreated back to mommy and daddy's <laughs> house. Like, that's kind of how it how it came uh how it was explained uh oh yeah and i just want to mention that ahmed kibitz is a was it a nocturnal math was that yes he's a type of creature that has three brains and 
just, I don't know, kind of gets off on calculus. I, I can't quite remember what the definition yeah. is. Really into figuring stuff out. Oh, he's also um, not telepathic. What He can read your mind if you're within a certain range of him. Isn't that Anasia can do that too? No. She's not a nocturnal. She, oh, she's clairvoyant. She's clairvoyant, and Ahmed mm-hmm. can read your like right. thoughts. But no one yeah, believes right. that Anasia is clairvoyant, but she's or or her species or something like that sorry i i was like chris do this part and now i'm just talking um so if you well, that's, that's the part <laughs> really so um if chris do you want me to read the summary or do you want to read it no i think you should read it just so that we can again come to a sort of understanding about how we both experience this book which i think we're on the same page about ha 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 book puns get ready for book puns <laughs> Oh, is this the book that's going to make us quit this show? No, it's not. Um, (laughs) It would take a greater force. Uh, All right. So this is the summary with all the main plot points to sort of give you. Yeah. uh, Plot points. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe that. (laughs) Sorry. That was the wrong choice of phrase. Wrong turn of phrase. Uh, This is a summary of the contents of this book uh, (laughs) so that you listeners can understand you know, the essentials of what we're talking about once we get uh, to the critique part of the show in a couple minutes. So this is a summary by, uh, <laughs> I don't know, C- Christopher Bookfucker wrote this. Um, I mean, I don't, <laughs> that's not what I do to them. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, here's a summary. <clears throat> Optimus Jan Spinner is a world-renowned author who is currently holed up in Lindworm Castle, lazing about. He's been here for about 200 years, ever since he had an adventure in the city of Bookholm that burnt the entire city to the fucking ground after he got in a tiff with the Shadow King in the labyrinth underneath the city. I mean, I'd stay away for a while after that, too. One day, Optimus receives a fan letter that seems to be written by himself, which contains the postscript, The Shadow King Has Returned which makes Optimus get off his ass and rush back to Bookholm. What ensues is a thorough cataloging of the changes that have occurred in Bookholm in the last 200 years since Optimus was around. We are introduced to live newspapers, booking arts, descriptions of the trade and economy of a book city, and hundreds of other things. These are usually delivered as big exposition dumps, like, say, when Optimus encounters a video with another author in a smoking den who recounts to him all the different types of book folk within Bookholm that have arisen since Optimus left. We get an exhaustive recounting of the consequences the Great Conflagration had on Buckholm, like the unearthing of entrances into the labyrinth that Optimus was lost within in the first book. Later, Optimus heads to the bookshop of his two friends, Ahmed and Inazia. Despite the fact that they had grown somewhat estranged over 200 years because of increasingly aggressive letters to each other, Ahmed and Optimus are ultimately happy to see each other. However, Ahmed is sick. And so sick that he decides to just will himself to death right then and there. He decrees his final will and dies. And Natsia tells Optimus to leave for the night because ugly morning is something not to be seen by anyone else. Seriously, what the fuck was going on there? And that she'll meet him in the morning to go see a play. The next morning, the author has run out of book jokes, so we are treated instead to approximately 200 pages dedicated to describing every facet of puppetism, which is puppet-based theater that has been all the rage in book homes since the fires. It's essentially a bunch of jokes about Western theater given in the form of theater reviews from Optimus, or him tearing through puppetism histories, or hearing about it from some educated theater goer next to him. He then meets with the overseer of the biggest puppet theater in book home, a giant worm man, and then the book ends. Fuck you. <laughs> It really is a very abrupt ending, too, right? It's just, like, he has this meeting with the guy, and then, like, two pages later, it's like, and now the story really begins, and I felt like I was the joke. I was the punchline this entire time. (laughs) Yeah, I did, too. Also, I I read it in that silly voice because that is the tone of Optimus Yarn Spinner. He is up his own ass so far, and (laughs) it's very, like oh no uh, like that's the character of the writing oh no <laughs> yes, you, can, you can describe optimus yarn spinner in two words it's oh heavens yes heavens me my scales <laughs> um so all right well let's let's discuss actually the several things that were that were great about this book um yeah there's a lot that's good here there's a there's there's a lot there's a lot yeah first off as much as I as much as I was just, you know, joking about the main character, like the characterization of the protagonist, 
the writing style is really beautiful and charming and well done. The translator, Mr. Brown John Brown Brown John Brown John 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 Brown Brown John Brown Brown John yes. Johnny Brown. Yes, Mr. Mr. Brown John. Wait, was it John Brown? No, it's John- it's Damn John it. Brown John. John Brown like John. Jean Valjean, but like- <laughs> <laughs> Mr. All right, J- JBJ here did a fantastic job, and also somehow I did not realize this was originally in German. And when we, I was just coming to this realization right before the recording, and this book makes so much more sense now that I know it was a fucking German who wrote this. <laughs> I don't know why, but that just something clicked in my brain, and I was like, "Oh yeah, that that kind of explains this." Germans. In any case, the translator did a fantastic job, and I'm guessing the original German was also equally as good, right? Uh, so, just think the quality of the writing was fantastic um i can i can just pull some examples to read oh here we go i'm just gonna read some selections here and there bestomel i whispered the name so loudly that the ugly beside me gave a start and several members of the audience turned to look smike glided across the stage like a gluttonous slug across a lettuce leaf humming and buzzing and cooing and purring his lines as beguilingly and ingratiatingly as he had in real life. Yeah. I don't know. Just, just some random characterizations. Uh, let's see what else I got here. Slug-like descriptor there is pretty good. Yeah, right. Um, all right, this is the beginning of the chapter called uh, Maestro Karodiak. During the next few weeks, my friends, I discovered how accurate Anatsia's prediction had been. I learned far more about puppetism than I really wanted. But isn't that the only sensible way of learning? Stuffing yourself with more than you can digest? Sucking up information like a thirsty sponge? Filling up with data like a camel of the desert hydrating itself for a long journey? It's the only way of finding out what you really need, what will lodge in the convolutions of your brain like intellectual, ideological fat, and form the inexhaustible reservoir that will sustain you for a lifetime. Any serious course of study is an orgy, an information-gathering bacchanal. Most of it you subsequently forget, like anyone who has indulged access. What matters is what sticks in the mind except that you never know in advance what it will be. So in with it! I've never thought much of strictly organized and methodical study. You can't arrange a library in alphabetical order until you've collected one. Great example. Great example. Yeah, it's got some real good stuff. Uh, I think I'm just going to like... Oh, actually, this is... (laughs) So this is like when he's first getting back into book home and he stumbles into Blossius Fistulator's unusual unbooks. Books are available elsewhere. A wise lindworm would have terminated the conversation at that point, but I couldn't restrain myself. You sell books in sausage form? I asked. Sausage books from a Melusinian anniversary in the Anthic Alps, the beanpole said haughtily. They're illuminated volumes of a very special kind, air-dried for five years by dumb druids. They contain aphorisms by Theogratia Dothentrot. You can also buy them by the slice. Uh, no thanks, I said hardly. I wanted to beat a retreat, but it was already too late. The druid had grabbed my cloak and was holding me fast. Do, do come in. Uh, I'll show you the pyramidal novels by Humidius von Quackenschlamm. They're all set in a triangular dimension. His eyes glittered with desperation. I suddenly got the picture. This bookseller was the victim of an imbecilic business plan, whether his own or someone else's. He was a captive in the shop filled with idiotic, unsaleable unbooks and had only been waiting like a starving spider in its web for someone of my kind to come along. The traditional book format is doomed, he hissed at me, and I saw beads of sweat collecting on his brow. We deal in unbooks of avant-garde design, circular books that can be opened like a fan. I hold the exclusive dealership for Ligaretto Loyal's accordion books. I felt genuinely sorry for him. He might as well have tried to sell square wheels or screws without threads or wickless candles. I invent something completely new. These were by far the most ludicrous aberrations of the book trade I had ever seen. They would molder away forever in the antique arcades. He realized that only too well. The print in our mini-books is guaranteed so small as to be illegible, he croaked after me when I freed myself with a jerk. Even the additions are tiny. No no thanks, really not, I called back and plunged into the stream of passersby. I mean, that's funny. This was, yeah, this was the uh, the MLM of the book world uh, (laughs) that he discovered. (laughs) Please, I've already bought 30 pyramid books. I need to sell 20. Please. (laughs) To make a... Um, yeah. But like stuff like that is charming and inventive, and honestly, like one of the better examples of creativity that we've seen. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, 
just really, uh, I guess, sorry, I'm like trying to follow our notes and now we're <laughs> out of order. Um, yeah, the I mean, the world building here was excellent. It was very inventive, this kind of wacky, fun world with ideas that really felt fresh, you know? A city based entirely on books and not just like, oh, people who like to read in libraries. Like, no, like buildings are made with books. Like, <laughs> oh, you guys don't get it. They're, they're really into the books. There's petrified books that come up from like the under that they can mine from the underworld that they use as building material. Um, there's people who like hunt books. There's like, I don't know. There's it's it's really intense and really well I don't know. Really, it seems really thorough. Can um, I read a little passage you know, from these... the scene where Ovidius and uh, Optimus are in the smoking den? There's oh, yeah. like this little paragraph that I think is a nice encapsulation of the kind of humor that we're seeing here, generally. It says, He scanned the smoky fumoir, craning his neck in an impressive manner so as to peer into every corner. Well now, he muttered. In this room at present are a bibliophrene two bibliots, a biblioclast, a bibliopath, a bibliophobe, no, two bibliophobes, three bibliomancers, they're unmistakable, and, uh, yes, a biblioscope over there by the bar, and that's only at first glance. Visibility is pretty limited in here. No bibliomancers today? No, not one. They tend to be rare. So this sort of just, like, listing out of all the possible permutations of biblio people out there will occur in other forms throughout the book, just to show you how many ideas the author came up with to, like, really spool out, okay, I have this book-based society, how wild can I get with it? Yeah, and it was, I mean, that part was really enjoyable, and I think the, you know, the funnier part for us is, like, this is basically just the also the world we have created in parallel Yes. With Terriblo, and it just yeah. felt really funny for us specifically. Uh, uh -huh. so, you know, this is prefab TBC lore if you're running a TBC D D campaign. <laughs> so if anyone wants to be the DM for that, here you go. Just you it's book home setting. Yeah. Book yeah. home in Maradonia, I feel like would be the two settings <laughs> oh that we would run. God. Oh. Someone who willingly wants to play a game in the world of Maradonia is uh a <laughs> masochist of the highest order uh, but yeah so I think just for us as people who review books uh, and have for oh eight years now uh, it yep. was it was pretty amusing especially since you know we always joke about you know the CD underworld and Terriblo's lair and there's like an underworld of book stuff in this in that's this here book. that's the labyrinth under the city yeah. also Terriblo shows up I don't point. know if he. I don't know if that character was Terriblo, but yeah, I could see. Nah, it, I, it was like a giant bookworm, which is kind of how we've characterized Terriblo overall in a way. So yeah, Un unknowable, but probably worm and octopus like. Um, in any case, yeah. So I there was just a lot of sort of the the background of this book and the the. Uh, dimensions of the book were really great, <laughs> not the physical dimensions. <laughs> <laughs> wow, uh, really nice size. Fits right on the yeah. shelf. Uh, yeah, so it, I was I was interested in the world and the lore and stuff. Uh, and it also started with a little silly mystery that I was like, okay, I'm interested in this. It opens with Optimus getting a letter that appears to be from himself. It's signed Optimus Yarn Spinner. And it's written as though he wrote it. And so he's like, what the fuck? But I didn't write this. And so that's what brings him back to Bookholm. And I was like, okay, so I guess we're going to find out who wrote this letter. And it's going to be like the driving mystery of the book. And oh boy, was I wrong. It was not. But at the outset, I was like, okay, I'm down for the mystery of who wrote the letter. Um, First 150, 200 pages of this book, I was kind of down with how charming it could be and how much of all these book-based puns and jokes and sort of parodies that we see. Yeah. Um, but, you know, this is a 432-page book, so... Uh, some things uh, got old real fast. Uh, before we move into things that were bad, though, I do want to just talk about how the dialogue was great and... Even though I didn't always love 
the protagonist the protagonist was well characterized he was well written um i would agree i, I mean optimus is supposed to be sort of a pretentious Both. idiot in a, in a lot of ways like he's very up his own butt as we've said before and you're supposed to be sort of annoyed by his mannerisms, I would say, sometimes with his, like, oh, by a, a, a new book thing that I haven't seen before. That's different from when I was here 200 years ago. My, how things have changed. And, like, he's, you know, very narcissistic about his own works and maybe a little bit insecure at times. But it's supposed to be for comedic effect, which at the start is, you know, I, I can roll with that kind of character. I don't mind if the main character of a work is stupid or a jerk or narcissistic yeah, or yeah. <clears throat> i and i enjoy curb your enthusiasm so <laughs> yes uh actually i'm gonna read uh i think this is the second chapter just the beginning of it <clears throat> return to lindworm castle you're welcome to pronounce me a megalomaniac for claiming that at the time the story began i had already become zamonia's greatest writer what else can one call an author whose books were being trundled into bookshops by the cartload? Who was the youngest Zimonian artist ever to have been awarded the Order of the Golden Quill? Who had had a fire-gilt cast-iron statue of himself erected outside the Grail Sundian Academy of Zimonian Literature? There was a street named after me in every sizable Zimonian town. There were bookshops that stocked my works exclusively, plus all the reference books devoted to them. My fans had founded associations whose members addressed one another by the names of characters in my novels. Doing a yarn spinner was a vernacular expression for triumphing in some artistic discipline. I couldn't walk down a busy street without attracting a crowd, enter a bookshop without causing female members of the staff to swoon, or write a book that wasn't promptly declared a classic. In short, I'd become a conceited popinjay pampered with literary prizes and public esteem. One who had lost all capacity for self-criticism and almost all his natural artistic instincts. One who quoted only himself and copied his own works without realizing it. Like an insidious mental disease of which the patient himself was unaware, success had overtaken and infected me completely. I was so busy wallowing in my own fame, I didn't even notice that the orm had long since ceased to suffuse me. Did I write anything of importance during this period? I don't know when I could have done so. I wasted most of my time reading from my own works in a self-infatuated sing-song, whether in bookshops and theaters or at literary seminars, after which I would get drunk on applause, condescendingly chat with admirers, and sign copies of my books for hours. Alas, my faithful friends, what I then considered the zenith of my career was really its absolute nadir. Long gone were the days when I could anonymously roam a town and undertake research without being pestered. I was instantly surrounded by crowds of admirers begging for autographs, professional advice, or simply my blessing. Even on country roads, I was dogged by hordes of fanatical readers eager to be there when the orm overcame me. This happened more and more rarely at first, and then not at all. And I didn't even notice, because, to be honest, I could hardly distinguish between the orm's trance-like state and a wine-induced stupor. So, you know, this is him having a little bit of a... You know, he, he's becoming self-aware as the book starts. Um, but he's still... <laughs> I don't know. I still think he's he's a little. Uh, there's not annoying. a there's not a journey that Optimus undertakes, mm -hmm. right? Like he he's still in that mindset for most of it. And he kind of realizes it here and there, but generally is still pretty self absorbed. I would say. Oh, you want to read the live newspaper thing, right? Actually, yeah, that's that yeah, counts as good yeah. dialogue. I'll find. Yeah, that. live newspapers are like this hilarious. I don't know if they're like. <laughs> podcasts or twitter i'm not really sure which they're trying to be but they're pretty funny either way they're sort of like the headlines of our of newspaper articles a lot and then they will actually read articles that they have stuffed in their newspaper cloaks you actually can't see them because they're wrapped completely mm -hmm. in newspaper so let me see if i can find uh, a really good read the start of the chapter I turned to look standing behind me in the dusty street and rudely tweaking my cloak was a dwarfish figure entirely encased in strips of newsprint indeed he looked like a newspaper on legs that had been run over and reduced to tatters curious sight though this was it took me aback for only a moment because I well remembered the so called live newspapers from my first visit to Bacolm they were smart nimble little gnomes journalistic errand boys so to speak who professionally disseminated the tittle-tattle of the cultural scene. I recalled that you could, for a small fee, tear the strips of newsprint off the gnomes and read them. 
that carried items such as Shock in the Summer House, Mimolette von Bimmel swoons after, contempl after completing her novel The Yondaway Year, Will She Ever Be Able to Write Again? Or Radiolarius Runk in a punch shump with Vartok smeddling at the Golden Quill. Rival authors accuse each other of plagiarism and alcohol abuse, then celebrate a liquid reconciliation. Or Relief in the Summer House, Mimolette von Bimmel able to write once more. Having recovered from her fainting fit after two days, she has embarked on her new bodice ripper, a candle underwater. Recalling this, I said to the gnome, No thanks, gossip doesn't interest me. He glared at me indignantly. Me not gossip, he said in a trembling voice. Me live historical newspaper, tested by Bookholm Tourist Association. All in Gothic. All in Gothic? I noticed only now that several tourists in this street were being followed around by similar little fellows attired in newsprint. The gnomes were reading aloud from their strips of paper. Live historical newspaper? I demanded suspiciously. What does that mean? Ah, the little creature's eyes lit up and he abruptly dropped his affronted tone of voice. New in city? All clear. You want me to explain? Yes, please. I said, nodding. I want you to explain. Live historical newspaper news service in Bookholm, he said eagerly. We walk along together. You ask, I read answer from old newspaper. One street, one pira. Six streets, five piras. Twelve streets, nine piras. Not satisfied? Money back. He handed me a sample strip torn off his paper costume. It was tomorrow's weather forecast, duly printed in gothic script. Rain was predicted in the afternoon. We walk, asked the gnome, rustling his sheets encouragingly. I thought for a moment, not a bad deal, actually. A smart idea for conveying information at an acceptable price. Or would it be too embarrassing to walk the streets with a gabbling dwarf in tow? I'd be branding myself an idiotic provincial tourist like the people who made spectacles of themselves in Florence by being chauffeured around in bridal carriages or gondolas. On the other hand, I could see any number of tourists accompanied by live newspapers and no one looked twice at them. The alternative would be to wander around for days engaged in guesswork, studying expensive tourist guides and pumping local inhabitants. All in Gothic, said the dwarf again, almost pleadingly. Silly as it may sound, my friends, that statement somehow clinched it for me. Gothic is so type of... Gothic is to typography what half-timbering is to architecture, so to speak. Both convey a certain antiquity coupled with sound craftsmanship and timeless durability. Gothic inspires confidence. What the hell, I said to myself. It's worth trying. Very well, I said graciously. I'll try a live historical newspaper for once. Do I pay now or later? Later, please, the dwarf cried happily. Not compulsory, but tips accepted if satisfied. So I think that's a good example of like the types of interactions that we get into here. And it's, it's again, it's charming. That chapter specifically is pr probably the most charming yeah, one in the I, whole book. I was like, oh, this is, this is a, this is like a silly, silly take on kind of news and social media. And I enjoyed it. I thought it was really good. And yeah, the dialogue makes sense. Like I'm never in this book. I was never like why did that person say that or that didn't sound like them like every all the characters were clear like they're I don't know I just thought that was also great so you know you really have not even just the bones of something good but you even you've got like you've got like organs in there and skin I mean you know this is this is like yeah you've got... if you want to talk about fleshed out there is an overabundance yeah. of flesh here <laughs> there's plenty of it you've got room for many many yeah, homunculuses there's, there's a lot of good stuff going on um and I was, you know, like I said, I was a little put off by Optimus's personality at first, but I was like, oh, the writing's really good. And, you know, live newspapers were kind of funny because that was what, like 50 page, 40, 50 pages in or something. Um, yeah. So anyway, you know, we're like, all right, this is going to be cool, whatever. Um, but then, but then it just continued and all of our opinions changed <laughs> pretty abruptly. Really? Uh, so we're going to. We're going to migrate uh, to the city of things that were bad in this book, Bill. <laughs> it's just, it's it's so long-winded, Paris. It's, it's yeah. 432 pages, and they just never stop going on about all the ideas that this author had, which you would think would be a great thing in terms of creativity. Like as we said before, lots of creative ideas. There's tons of them, list after list after list of different types of biblio people and like author parody names was one of them was like Herschlock Holmes Sherlock or something Holmes, like yeah. that which was like clearly yeah it was just clearly like a show there was like a waiting for Godot reference in here and like the, it's really exhaustive just like hitting every reference to western arts that you can possibly think of and at a certain point you're like okay but where's the story is no, there a story I also here? I thought the names were pretty stupid some of them 
I mean, we, we definitely got to like Skaldagarian lows at points with names in this book. <laughs> um, some of them were fine, uh, but a lot of them, like you pointed out, were just inversions or anagrams of current names. Like even, even the city of Florence, he calls it Florinth. I just, to me, that's really fucking lazy. Like I don't, it wasn't, it wasn't find, funny to honestly, me. Honestly, I find it cute. I like that stuff. Oh, I, I thought it was cute, lazy. But... Um, you know, I especially when you're putting all this effort into creating this world that's so different from our own. It's like, come on, just just put a little more effort. In. I don't know, but I think this author was also going for slight silliness. You know, so maybe it's fine. It wasn't nearly as bad as Skullduggery, but there were some names that definitely match that uh, that vibe. Um, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. In any case. Yeah, I hmm, I think so the problem with this is that the long-windedness of the book is a convention I believe that the author is using because the main character is long-winded as is known that you know it's known that his species is and he himself is but like while that might sound fun the reality of experiencing it is very not fun. Not <laughs> fun. Like sometimes you have this this like I don't know, this happens with music too. People have these like interesting concepts, but then when they actually do it, it's dumb and annoying. It's not actually brilliant, you know? So I, I think Or they have a lot of creative ideas, they just don't set it in the right way. And I think the major problem with this book is that there's a lot more literal telling than showing. Optimus is just going from person to person, finding out stuff about Bookholm when they just tell it to him and recount it to him. We don't get, you know, sort of background details by him observing a a certain group of people and like hearing, like pulling out what could have happened from that or being shown examples of the consequences of the Great Fire and how things pulled up in there. It's literally just he's reading history books or someone's telling him about what happened, which isn't as exciting a way to get through all this lore and detail that was built. And to be clear, this is an astounding feat of Mm -hmm. lore building, right? This is like Elden Ring (laughs) levels of lore about a book city. Yeah, come on, FrontSoft. Where's the fucking book hole mod? Let's go. We nerds. We need this. That's that's what I was thinking. By the time we got to the end of this book, I was like, this is just the wrong medium for all this work here. This should be like a and d splat book where you can like have adventures in the book world or literally an (laughs) Elden and ring mod right there where all this detail is in like the item yeah. descriptions of like weapons the things that you pick up as you go throughout but like in this form of me sitting here and reading 432 pages of this dude getting told what <laughs> happened in the last 200 years it's just excruciating after pa- about page yeah, uh, yeah. 200 so, I would my, say. so like i said i think optimus is supposed to be long-winded and like charming in in the way that he's sort of adult but is becoming self-aware of that didn't really work for me i was annoyed i found him generally annoying and especially because we experienced the entire book from his perspective like chris was just saying it's just him walking around getting told stuff and this book could have accomplished so much more and been so much better if it had just layered chapters with different characters being the protagonist in different chapters. Like, if we had had an Ahmed chapter and a Nazi chapter, a, a random Biblionaut chapter, a Shadow King chapter, God, that would have been so much more intriguing, seeing things from different viewpoints and just being able to pick up on the changes in the history and notable points by living through the eyes of these other characters. If I had had some escape from Optimus, I, I don't think I would have had this, like, fiery, burning hatred in my heart by the end. Um, but because I'm trapped <laughs> yeah, in his really fucking clotted cream and scone mind, like I just can't, can't escape. <laughs> um, and I, all right. So we've already, we've kind of explained very clearly the problems this book has, but this book's biggest sin, Chris, shall we talk about the book's biggest sin? Yes. 
It's when Optimus goes to a play that recounts the entire plot of the first book, albeit tweaked somewhat for dramatic purpose. So not, I mean, he it will interject and be like, mm-hmm. well, that's not how it happened in the first book. And this goes on for like, what you counted, it was 80 like 84 four pages. pages. So <laughs> let's, let's do a little percentage math here, Paris. Oh, and you know what? I also need to calculate how much content or how many pages the whole like, puppet history shit took up immediately after the play was over <laughs> that was like another 40 pages it's roughly about like 19 percent of the book is just recounting the previous book in play form which <laughs> is b- mostly a way to sort of describe all the contrivances contrivances of the puppetto circus maximus which is the uh the theater that they were watching the show in and how it's like very ostentatious. There's like a smell organ, and there's an olfactory solo that happens. Which is an idea we had in a previous episode. Yes. (laughs) I don't remember (laughs) what episode it is, but we were talking about the art, like a smell or like a smell concert. I don't remember why the hell we, we figured that out or talked about it, but I think you had to come up with the idea, and then we were like riffing on what a good smell concert would be. And there's a smell yeah. concert scene in here, and it's pretty good, and, but it's couched in this horrible part where you're just like, I, what, I guess I should just go read that book. It seems like there's something exciting happening in that book. Why am I in this yeah. one? So for, sorry, um, I don't know, the Kindle program just keeps crashing. I was going to just quickly count how long we, we are in a puppet note hell. <laughs> um, oh, here we go. Optimus just starts doing theater reviews of like puppet oh, and also, theater and also with... taking notes on puppet history to compile that and and so you have to sit there and read all of his reviews and all of his notes for his next book about puppets and I just at that point I was like just hand me a fucking razor blade it's... like <laughs> I mean, this get me out of here it's not even like the, we have any more cute book jokes it's like the author ran out of book ideas and was like uh fuck uh western theater uh i guess i'll make fun of that through puppet theater here's all of my ideas i had all these ideas i'm not even going to bother to try and do anything besides just spill them out on the page here oh no i've spilled all my theater ideas and jokes um speaking of which it was actually during so after I had survived the play, I was like, okay, all right, the play is over. And I was like, I got to see how many pages that was. I did the math. I was furious. And then I was like, all right, I'm going to finish this fucking book. But I was, I was tucked into bed. And then immediately after the play is over, we have to go through the puppet history book notes. And I literally am not, this is not an exaggeration. I'm tucked in bed. I'm pretty sleepy and also mad. And... My body is like, just let go. Stop reading this. And I'm like, no, I have to finish. My body's like, no. So I'm fighting with my own my own brain. And as I'm heavily skimming this, I have never skimmed so hard. Oh. <laughs> we, I, uh, same. Just glanced off the surface. I saw like Optimus start reciting another <laughs> list of things. And I was like, I'm not reading any of this. I'm just going yeah, to the like, next okay, paragraph. All right. And I literally fell asleep. Woke up and I was on a different page later in, in and I was still in the puppet history book notes and I was like it's time. To and I, I was like, God damn! It just rendered you yes. into a trance state where you just like your brain was like you don't have to pay attention to any of your existence at this point. Let I'll just I mean, take over. Exactly what happened? Um, okay, so that was uh, let's do some quick math here. Uh, 24 pages of puppet book history notes. So, so, so let's ratchet up the count here. We've got, uh, let me make sure that's correct. I'm sorry. I can't do math. 16 pages, uh, plus 84. So that's, yeah, that's a hundred pages of just no- nothing that needed to be here. <laughs> But, like, then the rest of the book is also him just talking, f- finding out about puppet theater history as well. It just ends after. Th- there's, like, he meets the 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 overseer of the Puppetto Circus Maximus, and he gets, gets, like, a brief interview with him. 
and then it just ends. Yep. And, it, and you know what? You know how it ends. You know With, how it ends, Chris. Yes, it says, and now the story really begins. <laughs> and I want it to die. Oh yeah, at that point, like flames rose up behind my eyes. And I wish nothing but for Bookholm to be burned down again. And I wanted to salt the fucking earth or <laughs> I don't know what you would do to prevent books from growing again. But just, just fucking. Uh, it really feels like yes. I was bamboozled by this book into thinking that there would be a plot. And at the end, it's like, ha ha, oh, fuck guess what? you. Guess what? No <laughs> news on that letter. Like, I don't know if we were supposed to assume that Optimus must have written it himself or it was the Shadow King or some other unknown party, but I feel like that mystery got dropped like maybe a quarter of the way through the book and we just never heard about it again. And Harris, how many pages do you think of like an actual plot happening in this book there are? Well, yeah, you have like guest letter goes to town, kind of tries to figure out the town and then goes to see his friends and then ends up back in uh, the underworld or whatever. I would say there's less than 30 pages of things happening in this book. Oh, I wouldn't. I don't know if I would go that far. I I just think that... um, yeah, this book's biggest sin is just wasting my fucking time, and I understand that it's supposed to be a cutesy convention, like, oh, our main character's long-winded, therefore the book is going to be, but my dude, that is not fun. It's not fun for the reader. Yeah, and it is I supposed to like- be just like a vehicle for all these ideas, right? That's really all that we have here. Well, yeah, and, and the other thing, so I-, I think I should stress that it's not like... We sat through that 84-page play, and that was all we heard about for the first book. No, this book is constantly being like, oh, yeah, that stuff that happened in in that first book. I felt like I was trapped in a fucking commercial for the previous (laughs) book, and I just could not escape. And I don't understand why you would write a book like this and not preface it very, very clearly with like, this is a companion to the first book. If you read the first book, here's some more lore. This is a lore appendix for the first book because that's what this is. I don't. I have no fucking idea why you would just be like, yeah, sure, just pick this up by itself. There, it's a sequel. There is a warning. It's not a sequel. There is. There is a warning at the start of the book. If you remember, I don't. The warning at the start of the book that you've picked up a poison book. Oh my god. <laughs> Wait, what were the what were the symptoms? Let me. Let me. Is it a fiery hatred for uh, <laughs> Walter Moore's? Because that's what I have. Um, ooh, accelerated heartbeat, fingers tingling slightly, a chill in your veins, tightening of the chest, breathlessness. I mean, that's just the like never-ending hum of my anxiety. But sure, <laughs> it's um, kind of hard to differentiate at yeah. a certain point. Oh, that's yeah, that's right. I thought that was pretty dumb. The letter he gets is like, this is a poison letter or something. Or I forget if it was a letter or if it was a book. No, this is just the book that we're supposed to be holding. Yes. Uh, yeah, it was very dumb. I guess my phone is now poison, which isn't an inaccurate statement. <laughs> yeah, so I guess you're right. The warning that this book was poison, um, I, I didn't need it. I, yeah, you know, we thought like, oh, this is a funny joke, and then like you're reading it. At first, it tastes good, I guess. You know, as the secretive way into your bloodstream, and then halfway through, you're realizing that you're just angry and tired, and you, know you what, want Chris? this to be over. I think we both missed this. Uh, right after it's like, oh, this is poisonous. It says, ah, this was just a bluff. This book isn't poisonous, of course. If I really want to kill my readers, I bore them to death with 260,000 pages of interminable dialogue about double-entry bookkeeping, as I did in my series of novels entitled The House of the Norselanders. I find that a subtler, subtler method. Okay, so at the beginning, he tells us he wants to kill us with bo- by we boring us to death. We're the joke, Paris. Yeah, we're the joke. Yeah. We're the punchline. This, yep. this whole thing we're doing here is the joke that <laughs> this person wrote a while ago. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I got nothing else. I feel like that's a pretty uh, exhaustive list of what was great, what was not great, and why I would not recommend this book unless you were I mean, really might, jonesing I'm, for, some, for yeah, some book stuff. 
book. I might recommend this book if you're, you know, such a bookworm that, that you really want just an exhaustive list of book jokes and puns and satires of real world authors delivered in cutesy form here and there. Like I, I can imagine the type of person that would enjoy this book, right? Is the person that like really identifies as like I'm a reader and wants to have something that's like poking fun at all that. Uh, I just I, think you could have delivered this in a very different way. Yeah, needs needs a lot of a lot of uh cutting. Uh I don't know, was there anything else we wanted to touch on before we go to Can We Fix It? Yeah, I mean Paris, there is one thing that I, uh, you know, I've I threw the gauntlet down in Drag Queen Dino Fighters <laughs> and I like I, you know, I, we got to do it. There's fake songs in this book. Oh, no. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I forgot about this. So I think we're now contractually obligated uh, with, you know, between Terriblo and our listeners and patrons um, to at least attempt uh, any songs that appear in a work. Um, I I'm going to find if... a couple of them. Yeah, I was going to say, do you have any bookmarks? Because I don't think I did i do have them highlighted in some notes oh here we go um there's a hurdy gurdy musician i do love the gurdy we have one in my house now um we can we can let's see like i can do this one i can read the preface and then figure it out yes um i tottered on in my tears thinking of the little one-eyed friends i hadn't seen for so long I sobbed to myself until I heard the strains of an old-fashioned hurdy-gurdy, such as Bukholmian street musicians often play. This dispelled my tearful mood, and I looked up. Standing here and there in the entrances to various buildings were small groups of loudly chatting, laughing people, usually a sign that there are places of liquid refreshment nearby. Excellent! My maudlin state of mind abruptly left me. Having instinctively headed in the right direction, all I needed to do now was settle on a suitable establishment. One particularly numerous group was being entertained by a busker, playing an ancient aerophone. He was no virtuoso, and warbling in a reedy falsetto. Oh no, there's notes on how this is supposed to be sung. <laughs> <laughs> uh, reedy falsetto. Whew, okay, this is going to be bad. Um... <laughs> or should I just should I just do it? Like, do what, do what you think. Just what you, whatever you heard in your head as you read that. <laughs> Started off with the Judas Priest register. <laughs> oh, really, falsetto. If you go to a home, don't forget to bring a book home. Bring a book home. <laughs> Traveler. Sick. If you awesome. go to a book home, don't forget to bring some book wine. Bring <laughs> some book wine. Be warned that those who do will themselves become books too. <laughs> awesome. Paris, that was stellar. <laughs> okay. I, I don't understand. Like, it takes me literal years to finish vocals for my actual band. I am struggling to finish this record. I need to, I need to be done writing by like March or April. But on this show, Chris is like, sing this stupid song. And I'm like, yep, got it in like 10 <laughs> seconds. I don't, I don't understand. I think I just, oh, you know what I need? I need my, I need the song, uh, the primary songwriters in my band, my, my two guitarists and, and my, I guess my drummer. I, I just need them to be like, here's a terrible book. Wink, wink, wink. And it's actually just yeah. <laughs> material for the album. And then I'll, I'll just have it done in like a week. Yes. <clears throat> that's the secret sauce there okay well that's a fantastic performance paris i'm gonna <laughs> read a section um that was so there was a couple of songs within that play that recounted the first book so like you know optimus himself is a character in the play um and i'll also read a little bit of a preface here um and then the song that happens after the melancholy background music that now struck up consisted only of some soft but endlessly repeated piano notes with rhythmical string accompaniment wasn't this the moving Andante con Moto by Zach Brestrumpf? At all events, it was admirably suited to this phase of the drama, for now began the less felicitous part of my first visit to Bookholm, one that marked the all-time low of my life hitherto, dear friends. Betrayed and hijacked, a helpless victim buried alive in the catacombs of Bookholm. Even a death march would have suited the context pretty well. 
The set was simple but realistic. Dark earth brown colors occasionally interspersed with gray granite. That's what the walls down there really looked like. All that broke the monotony were some old books picturesquely moldering away on rotting shelves. My character now launched into a rather silly sung monologue that somewhat detracted from the scene, which was perfect in other respects. <clears throat> oh, this is you? You're singing yeah. this? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Alas, a prisoner am I, far from the sight of the open sky. I can no hope at all discern and do not know which way to turn. Accursed be that poison book for which me so far from daylight took. Which has that monster fist to melon trapped me in the bowels of hell? I love how you also just mixed up the words there. <laughs> that's really, really added to it. That's, that's the order that happens. You no, you confused a bunch of like from which, why, and for. They were all over the place. <laughs> I was reading along. That's pretty good. I but I feel like that's a that's a realistic depiction of what sometimes happens during live performance. Hey man, I had to you know come up with a melody on the spot there. Yeah. Uh, okay, I'm gonna read. I'm gonna do one more. How about this, Paris? This is the one that we'll do together. Oh Jesus Christ! Okay, which is it? So it's it's when all the little books sh books are singing late, uh, slightly later. Books it is on page two hundred sixty five for my edition. Oh oh the. Uh, alas yeah, alas! How I sad to be. Okay, so okay. I found this to be like, you know, sort of like drama laden. So my version of this is, Alas, alas, how sad to be abandoned in depths of the night. Poor Jansperner will ne'er be free unless he can escape his plight. The reaper grim his scythe prepares, the jaws of death are open wide. While beasts are lurking in their lairs, the books his only hope provide. But soon he'll curse their bad advice, far for him to stray they will entice. Okay, am I supposed to do exactly what you just did? Because I don't know if I can do that. No, no, I want to hear your version. But this is a duet, so if we're singing against each other. No, we're not. I, okay. that, it's not that. It's just I want to hear your version. Oh, I mean, this is totally like a Solitude Eternus skull candle <laughs> mess. Like, this is sad. Okay. So, uh, I got to bring my, my, uh, uh, the other Crimson Horizon or Epicus Dumicus. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> uh, let's see. <clears throat> alas, alas, how sad. In the depths of night, for yon spinner will never be free unless he can escape his plight. The reaper grim his sight prepares, the jaws of death are open wide. Wild beasts are lurking in their lairs, the books. His only hope provide But soon he'll curse Their bad advice for him to stray They will entice There we go. There we go. <laughs> Clearly we can see who's the vocalist on this show. <laughs> I mean, I just got lucky there. It was like, it was like, hey, can you sing this like trad metal song about fucking Judas Priest books? And then, hey, here's a perfect like epic doom verse for you about, about I'll, evil books. I'll be sure to set it to some doomy riffs. <laughs> I, I mean, I could just give you some like concilium uh, graveyard riffs or something. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I already have an idea. All right, so I think that we've met our quota there. Three songs is enough. Um, yeah, there's I think more so. in the book. We're not doing every song. Relax. <laughs> there, no, there are way too many. Like, actually, actually, uh, full disclosure here. I was, I was stoked when it was like all these pages with big illustrations and like big chunks of verse. Yes. I was like, hell yeah, I can just woo! get me through this quicker, yes, please. Yeah, yeah. I can um, skim even harder. <laughs> yes. Uh, to be fair, though, I um I did want to talk about the illest. To be fair, that's not even the way. That's not even the clause I wanted for that sentence. I, sometimes I think my brain is just like on autopilot. Um, before before we end, uh, one of the other things I want to talk about that I forgot to put in the notes were the illustrations. Um, this is actually a a good a good thing. I think they weren't super my taste, but once I figured out that. Uh, Walter Morris, the author, also did all of the illustrations. I was like, Jesus fucking Christ. <laughs> That's so much yeah. work. That's so right. much work. Um, 
so much work and like clearly he has a really distinctive vision for this and I thought the illustrations were fun. I was glad they were there. I mean, maybe a lot of the joy I was experiencing was due to the amount of page space they took up. But, you know, I mean, it was was still good. Um, Whatever light in a dark world that we can find, Paris. (laughs) Yes. Uh, Yeah. And I, um, I, I guess I appreciate when there are sparse illustrations in books. I like that. Like, there weren't too many. I felt like there was just the right amount. They fit the style of the work i thought again like maybe not my favorite style but i thought they were effective for uh for this work and it's definitely achievement even if i didn't love the book it's definitely a a big achievement to write a book and also do all the illustrations for it uh it's it's, it's, yeah just a very different skill set and it's um yeah i imagine it's laborious so I mean, that's points in favor of the walter moores as a collective of authors conspiracy theory right oh my (laughs) god you're right fuck oh man yeah i mean there's like a lot of ideas in here right something that would possibly take many minds to conceive of oh my god that's why that's why the nocturno math is a character it's like the nocturno math has three brains hint hint eyebrow raise (laughs) eyebrow raise it's actually more than one of us uh i don't know um who knows but anyway Thank you, uh, Martin, for recommending this. And uh, Chris, what, can we fix it? What do you, what do you think? Can we fix it? Again, I'm going to repeat what I said before. It's the way this is delivered. If if this was a D&D supplement or an Elden Ring mod, all this material here would be fantastic as a way to fully flesh out a world and have all these little different bits and pieces that are interacting that you can stumble upon um, should you see fit. Um Another suggestion you had was chapters through the eyes of different characters so that we can get more showing instead of telling would have been the way to fix this. There's a lot of cool stuff in here. Um, If you just trimmed a little bit of the fat, a lot of the fat probably actually, and delivered it in a different way, I think we would have found this awesomely charming and lovely. Or maybe we should have just read the first book that had an actual plot and probably still had just as creative ideas. Yeah, well, I mean, but this was the one that was recommended to us by a patron. Yes. So this is, <laughs> so. this, I mean, that's how this works. That's how we end yes. up twisted up in these little fucking, you know, uh, I don't know, book mistakes. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like for me, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> I don't know. I just, this really should have been like a, a supplemental lore companion book, kind of like, um, <clears throat> God, sorry. Um, sort of like uh, uh, what's what's um, what is the is the world of ice and fire? Um, yeah, you could also argue that fire and blood is also kind of the same thing, but they're yeah. both doing the same thing, really. Right. So you have books that are sort of you know companion lore building pieces that aren't really a standalone book. I just feel like it was a little. It was a little. It was like this is a sequel, and I mean there are a lot of times where you can pick up a sequel and read it and enjoy it same with films without necessarily seeing or reading the first thing and i don't know this one felt just felt like it really needed to be distinctly tied to the first book um as sort of a yeah like a lore appendix uh secondly please please for the love of for the love of terriblo and the shadow king do not waste a hundred pages of my reading life to make me sit through an entire play that describes the first book in your series and then a bunch of uh, notes that are supposed to make up a book eventually. I, Good God, that all could have been condensed into 10 yes. pages and I would, and it would have been fine. You know, similarly, I know your main character is supposed to be long-winded, but... We don't have to be with the long-winded character the entire time, and long-windedness does not have to be the concept for the entire work because it is frustrating for a reader. Uh, yeah, I and like Chris said, my idea of varying the perspectives by chapter. I mean, this is something I think he and I both really enjoy in books. It's something we see in Game of, in uh, Song of Ice and Fire, and um, also in the um, mm. Malazan series. <laughs> <laughs> um and, my lozenge and, 
<laughs> and in other works. And it's very effective because you're not, you know, like in, in this example, when your main character is a little up his own butt and kind of annoying, you're not just trapped in his mind the entire time. You can see things from a different perspective. And then you also aren't wasting time with all this telling of things to a single character when instead you could be showing by having others experience things. Uh, so yeah, I just, just really wanted a uh, varied protagonist by chapter cut the fucking play and puppet history notes down, please cut it down 90%. Literally it just, it really could have been 10 pages, all of that. Um, and Oh, yeah, and then don't drop the mystery of the letter. I guess that was the other thing that really bugged me is, like... Half a plot, I think, is really <laughs> what you're asking. <laughs> well, no, I mean, we've we've talked about how a lot of the sort of the basic, uh, you know, like the hero's journey plot is kind of the one that we see in <laughs> everything because it's, it's just, like, characters decided to be cool by acts of fate and then they go on a journey and develop and change and become very powerful and they fight the evil thing and win. Like, I was actually glad that it didn't, subscribe to that formula but there's just no formula yeah. <laughs> which is not great it's like but... the author was like heard your criticism was like fine then you'll get nothing <laughs> yeah nothing. I, I mean i mean that's certainly what Treblo said they were like yes. ah <laughs> ah you hate that classic plot structure let me uh let me get in there uh so i actually think that that's kind of a point in its favor that it didn't subscribe to the usual structure that we see but it needed a little like i just thought i was i was fucking clinging to that letter mystery at the beginning and then <laughs> it was like i was clinging to the like the wheels of a plane as it was taking off and then after a few hundred feet i just fell off and was just splattered <laughs> on the tarmac um yeah it was just a bummer because it starts off with the, and i was like oh if this is gonna be like a like a book fantasy mystery i'm down with that but it only comes up again when Optimus meets his friends and then they're like, no, we, we sent it to you, but we didn't write it. We found it in, you know, the Hammer of the Witches and the Malleus Maleficarum, except in this, it's the Hammer of the Uglies. Mm -hmm. um, and then we, we sent it to you. And so, and that's the last we hear of it. it that's it. There's nothing. And, it does mention at the uh, end where it's like, I guess I never figured out that letter mystery, and now the story can really begin. Uh, Fuck you. Yeah, I was just like, that sucks. So, I, and it's not, it's not like I'm asking for, and then, and then a guy showed up and said, Optimus, I wrote that letter as you. Like, what I really wanted was maybe some options as to who wrote it and why and you kind of had to figure it out along with him and maybe it wasn't totally clear in the end but you had somewhere to go and it was just abandoned, totally abandoned. So anyway, yeah, a lot of things could be fixed, but this book has a lot of potential um, for all the reasons we said. A lot of good stuff said. in there. Yeah. It, it, I, it yeah. is worth saving, I would say, worth trying to fix. Yeah, I agree. Worth trying to fix for sure. <sighs> all right, Paris. Right. Well, we've found the Terriblo's home world, I suppose, which is, I guess, getting added into the, the TBC lore here. We're just stapling this on so we don't have to do our own work. Yeah, I mean, why not? It's the least this book could do for us after wasting so much of our time. All right. Well, once again, thank you so, so very much, Martin. This was, uh, this was a good one. It's a good one for us to uh, read and think about. So we appreciate that. Thank you for being a patron and a longtime listener. And uh, we look forward to your recommendation for um, 2023, which hopefully we will not read in December again. Yes. <laughs> so anyway, um, hopefully this was enjoyable for you. And uh, we're looking forward to coming back in the new year with some new terrible and dumb stuff. Uh, we are still, we've, we've built out some of the schedule. We are trying to uh, be a little kinder to ourselves in terms of time next year, because we've got stuff going on. Like Chris and I are both trying to finish albums and record them. I have to get married next year and not have, that makes it sound like a, like a thing. I know I'm, thing. yeah, I'm getting married next year. Uh, and so I have to like, figure out all that shit with my uh with my fiance and um yeah i don't know life just you know we both have day jobs like it's just i'm doing more work at the day job so right. 
you may be seeing a post on the Patreon with a page limit <laughs> for recommendations. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're basically, you know, we don't want to get to the point where we become so overwhelmed that we can no longer do the show. So we're trying to head that off by choosing a lot of really short books and trying to keep patron recommendations to perhaps a lower page count. Um, I think after after um, September uh, in 2023, things will open up again. Um, and maybe we won't have to be so strict. But we, you are going to see a lot more like shorter, probably more ridiculous like self-help books and stuff because <laughs> uh, it's just, you know, we, we just need to, we need to crack yeah. down and make sure that we're not um reading 400 page books literally every week because we i, I mean i also we both also read for pleasure just just so you all yeah, know so like so many hours in here <laughs> yeah. and we would like to also experience joy while reading sometimes <laughs> yeah and we'd also like to do things uh like finish our records for our bands and uh you know get married and and do some some traveling and stuff i mean you know things that humans do um yes Considering this, this is really just a hobby show. Like we are not on a network. We don't get paid to do this shit. It is self-funded by patrons, or self-funded. It is um, funded by our patrons. Uh, y- y'all pay for you know books, recording equipment, uh, hosting, uh, and associated things like you know postage when we send books to people and stuff. So you know this is this is a labor of love or masochism i'm not really sure which uh somewhere in the middle there <laughs> yeah somewhere in the middle no uh, excuse for two friends to get together and talk once in a while yeah certainly a labor of friendship um but yeah so in any case that was my uh yarn spinnerish explanation as to um <laughs> what you might see in the next year uh we hope you all have a wonderful wonderful holiday season um and we will be taking a little break so we pre-record a bunch so that we can take about two two to two and a half months off um so that we can kind of you know recoup our sanity and prepare for the next season so uh we are we've already recorded a couple episodes into the next season so uh yeah we hope you enjoy them and please have a lovely holiday season we hope you get some time for rest to read some good stuff um and spend some time with people you like being around all right here's where we thank our patrons Thank you to Greg, Veronica, Will, D, Jared, Arant, Senior, Jakub, Lycoris, Elliot, Kieran, Martin, Luchek, Miri, Yanka, David, Anya, Patricia, Austin, Donnie, Crimson, Paladin, Beast with the Least, Scott H., Robin, Lax, Stodies, Of the Void, The Taco Eating Unicorn, Last Man on Earth 01, Funny Robot with Antennas, Hobbyboy93, Harry, Renee, Emmy, and our Kofi donor Kiwi Thing. Thanks for another year of Terrible Book Club. Thanks to you guys. Help make it happen. All right, Paris, um, I hope you also have a wonderful holiday season here. Here's to another year of terrible booking. Hopefully it's a little bit less painful or maybe more painful for the entertainment of our patrons here. We'll see how that shakes out. Um, I'll see you next year. All right. Happy holidays, Chris. Happy holidays, y'all. And uh, we'll see you next year. Farewell. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to another episode of Terrible Book Club. Terrible Book Club is an independent podcast produced by your hosts, Paris and Chris. Sound design and audio editing by Chris, with sound effects and music by Epidemic Sound and sometimes also Chris. Our theme song is Kiss by Yearn, which is, you guessed it, actually, also Chris. You can find more of his soothing synthy sounds on Bandcamp at yearn.bandcamp.com. Do you want us to review a book of your choice on the show? Do you want access to some extra audiovisual weirdness? If so, become a patron at patreon.com slash terriblebookclub. If you'd like to send us a one-time tip instead, you can do that at ko-fi.com slash terriblebookclub. You can also support TBC for free by sharing the show on social media, following our accounts on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or Goodreads, telling your friends about your favorite episode, or by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, or anywhere else on the internet. To send us book recommendations or your adorable pet photos, send an email to terriblebookclub at gmail.com.